On the road again. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good, man. I'm so glad that you are here. I'm so glad to be here. Brian, thank you so much for sharing your car and your story. Uh, he loves the attention. Uh, so his car is out front. If you want to take a picture with it after, it's a beautiful car. Um, you can check it out. I don't know if you saw my face when he hit the, hit the gas. <laughs> I laughed because I wasn't ready for that, man. I'm like, whoa, all right. It was, it was good, though. So Frank, thank you. Frank Avernieri, thank you again for spending hours and editing that. And we have... Um, we have about three more of these. We've got two recorded, and we're going to be getting those ready for you. And then we have one more we're going to do. I love it because it helps you get to know. Because what you know, we say it all the time, but we really want to live it. We believe that the church's strength of the church is not found in programs and um, professionalism, and and it's found in relationship. Really building real relationship with people. Because at our core, that's what we all want. And but we got to create con- we got to create a space for that. We got to create opportunity to build relationship, and that's why when we did our highlights, we have these things going on. We had our we had a manly meetup last night. We had a couple of guys. We had a great time. I had to confess, I'm a little sore, but it was a great time raising goat carts. I um, our our last place uh, contestant was Kevin, and he won the Christian trophy. All right, last to be first, first to be last. So you know, um, then Rob won first place, and we're just praying for him. So. Uh, <laughs> We had a good time, but we, we, we carve out these times, we build a relationship. These videos are a part of that. Not only to hear story, is to hear people's stories, hear where their journey's at, because it's easy and kind of abstract to maybe hear it from a stage, from a guy standing up to preaching and talking, but to really hear everyday people saying, here is my encounter with God. It makes it so much more real. I'm going to have more stories to share. And in the future, we've decided we're going to find new ways because we want to hear, if you have, each of us have, have a story. Every one of us has a story. We want to hear your story. We want to walk with you in your story. That's kind of the journey of this whole series on the road that we believe that God meets us where we are at in our journey. It was so cool as we've been following the last five weeks that we've been following Jesus as he walked. Every week I've said it, but just to remind you that Jesus, in his time, his three years of ministry, he traveled over 3,100 miles walking, meeting people along the roads, meeting people in towns and villages. And we felt like, you know what? We want to take this summer to kind of follow him, get on those dusty trails with him, follow him and his disciples, and just see Jesus interact. Because, you know, when you're on a road trip with someone, you get to know people, don't you? You're stuck in a car with somebody for a while. You really get to know if you like them or not. You get to really see who they are. And and if you've gone to church all your life, or you really haven't gone to church, you may have this idea of who Jesus is, and and, and it could be really far off from who he really is. And that's our goal in this series as we've been following, that you will see Jesus for who he is. My belief is you see him strip away all religion, strip away all church talk, and look at the person, Jesus Christ, you will love who he is and what he stands for and how he lived. And not second, here's a, here's a second reason, this, the goal for this series, not only is it for you to see Jesus for who he is, but two, so that you will encounter him in your journey. Because as I said, we all have journeys, all different paths, but God wants to meet us where we're at. Journeys can sometimes take us not into the place we're going to end up. You, it, you thought you were going one direction, you thought it was going to go this way, and it went a different direction. Anybody been like that in life? Um, let me tell you about a time I shared uh, one of my first early, the first week, talked about one of my road trip stories in Alabama. If you missed that one, you can go check that out another time. Um, Alabama's an interesting state. If you're from there, love you. Um, this is when I was 17 years old. I was a, high, a senior in high school. And so I'm going to say this little, one of our, our mission, one of our core values is we don't judge people. We love people. All right. I'm going to put that out there before you start judging me. All right. So 17, and I really, the speed limit was a suggestion. It depended on what was at the other end that I needed to get to. I had a, I had a 1979 Volkswagen Rabbit diesel, if you know what that is. Yes, not a car that you're going to be scrolling around in helping pick up any girls or anything like that, man. It was ugly. It was a pea green with gray polka dots because I was going to paint it a different color, but I didn't get a chance to, so I just primed it, all right? And I thought I'll get to it later. Never did. Um, and it was, it was a diesel, so black smoke came out. Anyway, that's part of the story. So I'm, I am late to school, which was the majority of my high school career. And my 
my, my sister's in the back seat, and we're driving down, kind of doing a little, a little small in-between, a little town, and it was a four-way lane street with a lot of gas stations coming in, a lot of parking. And, and this car, I'm driving, I'm, I'm, I'm doing really good. I'm looking at my clock thinking we're going to slide in at the right moment, perfect timing. And, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this car pulls out of the parking lot, not into the slow lane, but all the way across right into the fast lane and does not proceed to pick up sp- speed. Seems like slows down. Well, in all my godliness and Christian life, I said, I'm going to teach that person a lesson. I'm going to show them. They should not get in front of me. So I had this idea as a 17-year-old young man who, who doesn't see much else. I'm going to, I'm going to act like I'm going to run right up behind them. Look, I'm going to run into them. And the last thing I'm going to whip over, all right? This is going to scare this guy. I'm going to show him who's on the road, all right? So I gun it. I'm even going fast. My little Volkswagen's puffing out black smoke. It's, it's going as fast as it can. I'm up on it. I can see the person look up. Eyes get widened and I'm coming up. I mean, this plan is working perfectly. At, this is exactly how I dreamed it up in the few seconds before this. At the last second, I whip it over in my great skills of driving. Little did I know, just split seconds before I whip over, I'm coming up on this guy. Someone else pulls out in the correct lane. It is a four by four jacked up truck. It was nice, had new, beautiful rims. And man, I just whip over and I hit him. He loses control, doesn't, he kind of stops. And, I, and my little Volkswagen, I didn't do anything to it. I was like, hit it. And then I, every, all my blood drained from my face. I'm like, I look in the rearview mirror. I'm, now I'm slowing down. Everybody, everything else has ceased to exist. This huge, musk, tattooed dude, big beard, gets out. You think, that was funny. It wasn't funny at the time, all right? I'm like a 17-year-old kid. I like, he looks, he gets out. I'm like going probably 10 miles an hour. Everybody's passing me. He looks at his tire, looks down the road at me. I'm still in the rear mirror. Points at me. Says, right here. I'm like, I'm so nervous this morning. I pull into like the turning lane to stop. And the guy starts yelling and screaming, get back over here. That trip did not go the way I intended. I had a vision of how it was going to happen. And it was the opposite. I went back there. The guy said, I could call the police or you can pay me over a long extended period of time. <laughs> I think he got a lot more money out of me. I said, yes. And so I'm not saying this is what you should do as a pastor. You should not judge but my journey, I had intended it to go one way. I had this idea of what it should look like. This is how I planned it. This is how I dreamed it's what it's supposed to be like. But in the end, it was far different than what I'd originally planned. The same is true in our life sometimes. We've been following these stories of the last five weeks of journeys with Jesus where he met people, right? In these towns and he came almost at the perfect moment, right? And he comes in as the widow's widow's. Uh, a son is being carried out dead and, and he comes and brings her back to life. And then the woman who had been, had been had an issue of blood, he heals her and then heals a blind man and heals lepers. And he stands there and it seems like God, people had need. God showed up, needs were met. The miraculous happened. And these are great stories. And I think if we looked at our life, we could see that. But I would say in our lives today, as we're sitting here, we can think of times in our journey that we ask God to show up. That we say, God, we need you to show up here. We need you to answer this. We need to step in here. I need you to fix this. I need you to save me. I need you to heal this in my marriage. I need you for this. And it's silence. Ever been there? I mean, let's be really real. I think every one of us has been there. Where we... We plead, God, I need you in this area. If you're real, show up now and do this. What do we do when God disappoints us? What do we do? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) It's true. We try to do it our own. We're going to follow a journey. We're going to follow a story today on Jesus' journey a story that resonates with these same tension. What happens when God doesn't show up when we need him to? A story that if you've been in church, a part of your life you're probably familiar with and never been in church, you maybe not have heard it. Or It's a great story in John chapter 11. It's a story of Lazarus. And we know the end of the story. And the fact of the matter is sometimes the Bible 
gives us a lot of stories, the widow's son, and we, we forget there's time that happened in between. But this is a story we get to see the whole point of disappointment with Mary and Martha, his sisters. John chapter 11, if you have your scriptures, we're going to turn there. What do we do when God disappoints? Because the fact of the matter is there's two things we can do. We can stay in a place of trust waiting on God, or we can turn as someone said over here and said, we can just do it on our own. Say, God, you have failed me. You have abandoned me. You have not answered this. And so I'm done. I'm walking away. And I would say in my heart, I, and, and as I was preparing this message, I turned to Amanda early uh, yesterday as I was getting, finally coming through it because it was really interesting I was preparing. I was, it was getting too complicated and I was trying to go all over the place. And I said, I just need to simplify this. I need to think, what do I, what do, I do when God does not show up when I ask him to? What do I do when I ask something from God and he, does, he is silent? And so we're going to look at this story. We're going to take some truths because here is how we trust God because trust is hard, right? Is trust hard? If I could see him, it'd be so much easier. Trust is hard. John chapter 11, we'll start. And we're going to kind of, we're going to kind of read through the chapter. We may skip a couple of verses. I would encourage you on your own when you get home today, read chapter 11 for yourself. Maybe God will bring something to you that was not spoken today. But John chapter 11, starting in verse one, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. Just pause there for a second there. I hope we have a map up on the screen. I've been trying every time to kind of give you context because if you grew up in church, you haul these names, all these places and really couldn't get context. He is down here. Um, Jerusalem is right back here. This is the main kind of happenings, everything going on. He's been up here in this area. He is actually in the chapter four. He's over east of the Jordan River. He's been hanging out here. Here is Bethany. It's about 11 miles from Jerusalem. It's about from Bethany to where Jesus was at about 20 miles. And so Jesus is on the other far side of the Jordan and his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are in Bethany and Lazarus is sick. It says, and he lived in Bethany with sisters, Mary and Martha. In verse two, this was Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped it with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling them, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. When I read that, it really, I liked it because... You, they were trying to think of what words are really uh, would cause Jesus to act. Then Lazarus, Jesus, your dear friend, the one you really love, the one you, you know, the one you're really close with, that Lazarus, he's sick. I, we want you to come and heal him. So many times in our life, we want God to move in our life, but we think we got to have the right magic words. Have you ever, have you ever done that? Where you're like, maybe I just didn't say it the right way. Maybe, maybe I don't have the right words to God, so I need to, I need to say it with a lot more these and thous in it. Or I, I've got I to gotta have some articulate prayer that just brings people to tears. And that's the prayer that will got God's attention, right? So Mary and Martha are like, hey, my, my, my brother's sick. We need Jesus to come because they knew who Jesus was. They had seen Jesus act. So how do we get, how do we, how do we, um, get Jesus passionate about it? Jesus, your best friend, the one you love, he's sick. Come Come take care of this. We think, well, Jesus, God is my best friend. I didn't know that. Okay, I'm going to go right now. We're going to fix this situation, right? But Jesus, when he heard it, said, Lazarus is sick. Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. And it will happen for glory of God, so the Son of God will receive glory from this. So, although he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was, for two more days. Wait, just don't get all spiritual for a moment. Let's don't go past those two verses. Don't go past that last phrase. They, their brother was dying. Jesus, who had already raised people from the dead, had proved he had power to overcome death. He had what he could do. He could do it. It wasn't a a question if he wanted to do it. It wasn't even a question if if Jesus really loved him. Have you been there with God? God, do this. I mean, how can you not do this? This is this is good. This is for you. This is this is a good thing. You have the power to do it. You can say in a heartbeat it'll happen. That's the question I ask myself. Have you ever been there? Like God. Why don't you, you can do this. I know you can do that. Why don't you do it? Instead of Jesus saying, yep, I can. Let's do it right now. He says, no, I'm going to wait two more days. Have you ever been with someone in the hospital who's sick, is close to death? 
How do days seem? Years. You're in a place of fear. Your, 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 your brother, the one that you love, is lying on his bedbed. The one that can save him is not showing up. They waited. It's only 20 miles. It's a day. Next day, they wake up. Jesus is going to be here. Surely Jesus is going to be here. Surely this is someone that Jesus loves. He's going to heal him. But he doesn't. Two more days. Here's the fact of the matter. How do we move through that? Has God, I'm going to say the word fail because don't get too freaked out by that word. Has God seemingly failed you, not shown up when you've asked him? How do we trust him? When we know he can do something, but he doesn't. Personal, how do I? When I ask God, please, Jesus, please do this. I need your help. Please answer this. Please step in here. Please heal that person. Here's what I have to do. The first thing I have to do is I have to remember and recognize that God's ways and his purpose and his perspective is far different than mine. I have a limited perspective. We all do, really. If you want to look for a perfect illustration of our limited perspective, if you read any kind of medical advice on when you should drink coffee or not drink coffee, (laughs) the experts say if you drink coffee, it's going to lead to cancer. Stop drinking coffee. Okay. Well, I didn't do it anyway. I stopped drinking. But then I just read a, I just read a thing just a couple weeks ago that said, long life if you drink coffee. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we all live that way. One person comes, hey, this is, what we're supposed to, this is how we're supposed to live. Perspective. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then it changes. Don't do this. You got to be doing that. We live in a limited perspective. But I believe, well, I have to trust that God sees a broader perspective. He sees the full picture. The scripture in Isaiah, if we can get them all on the screen, talks about that. Yeah, no, that's not it. All right. Man, you know what? You're going to have to trust me. I'm going to find the reference because that is not it. It says this, that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are far beyond our thoughts. That God sees in a perspective that's not limited by time or revelation. Revelation meaning, wow, I just discovered something new, right? Scientists are trying to find out coffee. I just discovered something new. So this is now our new reality. God doesn't have time. So what he sees is the full revelation at one point. He sees the whole picture. And when my perspective and when my experience seems to be, I see it this way, this is my reality. And God, if you don't show up here and in this way, then it's going to be too late. I need you now and I need you to answer this way. And if you don't, then what's that speak about you that you don't care for me, that you're not involved in my life, or maybe you're just not able to. Because we look at circumstances and we look at problems from our perspective, which is, which is limited. For me to trust God in my life, I have to always remember that although my perspective, I see it one way, that that God, if he is not answering in that moment the way I think I need him to act or the way I need and the time I need to act, I've got to choose to believe that he sees something bigger than me. In fact, in the scriptures here, when Jesus' disciples are talking about going, he says, first of all, we're going to wait a couple days because here I'm going to get glory. The Father's going to get glory out of what's about ready to happen. First of all, God's vision and purpose is always about giving him glory. I don't like that. I like receiving glory. Don't you? I like being the man that saves the day. I like feeling like I can make something happen. But God says, you are not God, Blake. It is not about you. I love you. I am for you, but it's not about you. It's about me. All of creation is about me. The heavens, the Bible says, declares the glory of God. And his firmament that showeth his handiwork, the, night, the stars 
twinkle every night for one reason, to to proclaim the glory of God. We look at the universe and say, it is so big. Why is it so big and we're so small? Because it takes that big of a universe to proclaim the glory and the power of God. God can come, when we pull him into our circumstances, and understandably so, we want him to move in the mundane. We want him to move in our troubles and hurts. We pull him down and say, God, fix this. He says, I get that. My heart is burning for you. I love you. I want want to fix this, but you are asking me something that you don't understand the bigger perspective. So one thing when God doesn't act and I am struggling and I'm angry at God, which by the way, be angry, share your struggle, yell at God, be real with him. He wants relationship with you. He doesn't want a robot that just kind of follows the motions. He wants you to have a real relationship. When you're excited and praising him, praise the lot of your voice. If you're struggling and you don't understand why, just don't say, well, I've just got to. No, you say, God, why? What's going on? Show up. Just be there. He can handle it. He says, hey, the disciples, there's going to be glory again out of this for me. People are going to see something they never saw before. Not only that, they're arguing back and forth. They're afraid because they, if he goes back to Bethany, which is close to Jerusalem, he was run out of Jerusalem just a couple of days before, threatening to kill him. The disciples, if we go back, we're going to die. Jesus says, we're going to go back. And, and, and one of the disciples uh, that called the twin, did a Mr. Thomas, said, well, let's go go back and die with Jesus. <laughs> I, I love it. It shows there's real people following Jesus. These are not spiritual people that just float around and just, um, oh, everything's good. And I trust Jesus for everything. Tom's like, yep, you're going to go back. Let's go back and die with him. <laughs> just so we're going back. And then he said, and then he talks to him. He's trying to, Jesus trying to say, Lazarus is just sleeping, but I'm going to go wake him up. And the disciples who are very, like me, very low shelf people, if he's sleeping, you don't have to go wake, he'd wake up on his own, he'd be all right. Jesus like, this is my own uh, words and my own, I don't know how Jesus, I'm sure Jesus like, Lazarus is dead, I'm going to go wake him up. And he says, you know, in fact, I'm glad we haven't done it yet. Because what you're going to see me do is going to help your belief. Here's the fact of the matter. Our faith is only strengthened or mainly strengthened in the struggle. Rarely, our faith is strengthened where everything's great. In fact, although I want it all the time, if everything was perfect and great all the time, because I know me, I don't really need God. I got this thing. In fact, here's how stupid I am. I know this lesson. Everything goes well. I'm like, you know what? I don't need God right now. I, I've got it all under cover. Then it falls apart. I'm like, I oh, God, I need you. And I'm sorry. And, and everything gets better. I'm like, I don't need you. And it goes back to that cycle. And here's the fact of the matter. The struggle, the unmet expectation, the silence when God is not there is not that God is absent, but just like it was with Brian, God is always walking with their life, but sometimes he stays silent because what he's more interested is our faith growing. It's hard. It's where our faith grows. So when I have to struggle and I'm gonna trust God, the first thing I say is, God, I believe that you're bigger than me and I believe you see something greater than me. I'm going to trust you. We keep moving forward. Verse 17, it says, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had been been in his grave for four days. I don't know how that story, I don't know how that happened, but it was very clear they needed to let Jesus know, Jesus, you know what? You've showed up too late. He's been in the grave four days. Don't, Don't even worry about it. Just go back home. You've missed it. Here's another thing that I think if you follow Jesus at any time in your life, you've experienced this. God's timing is never our timing. When we say it's too late, God says, that's about the perfect time. (laughs) It's true. Humanly speaking, he'd been in the grave four days. He's smelling. There's no hope. There was no misdiagnosis. He is dead. God, if you just showed up four days early, you could have handled this. If you would have showed up when I asked, you just, see God, I told you, if you just do what I asked you to do, everything would be all right. 
we do that. If you just would do what I ask, God, I had it all perfectly planned out. But God says, my timing is not your timing. And what may be a dead end in your, your reality is not a dead end in mine. What is a signed and sealed done thing with you is not for me. I can do what you cannot. We keep moving forward. <clears throat> Bethany is only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many of the people have come to console Mary and Martha in their loss. When Mary got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stood or stayed in the house. I think that's so powerful because we all do that. God, they both sent for him. Remember the first time Mary and Martha sent a message saying, Jesus, come, my, my brother's about ready to die. When Jesus does come, only one shows up because I think Mary is angry. Understand, look, I'm not, I'm not trashing Mary and Martha. I'm Mary and Martha. You are Mary and Martha. God didn't show up when he needed to show up to fix this situation and I'm done with it. I'm not even gonna go meet you. But Martha comes. I don't know what feeling she thought. I don't know what was going through her mind as she was walking towards Jesus. Maybe she's a ready to tell him off. Like, I told you. Maybe she's just broken. Because my brother's dead and you could have done something. In fact, it's kind of what she says when he first sees him. When Martha got, and it says, but Mary said in the house, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. But here's the, here's the statement, you, but here's where trust looks like. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Mary avoids the hurt and pushes away from God. When you and me, when God disappoints us, when God doesn't show the way we want, when people in church take advantage of you, when there's brokenness in your life, there's two things we do. We either say, you know what? I'm done with all church. I'm tired of hypocrites. I'm tired of the people who act all this way. I'm tired of them judging me. I'm just completely done and I'm pushing away from it. And understandable because Christians have given a bad name to Jesus a lot of times in how we act. But the fact of the matter is what Mary does is Mary goes head on into the very disappointment. She doesn't try to hide from it. She doesn't try to bury it. Martha doesn't try to hide it. She doesn't try to bury it. She heads into the very situation, looks straight at it and says, Jesus, if you have been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. But even now, faith, I know. Interesting for the word know in Greek translated here is remember. I remember, I know that God will do what you ask. You know what she was remembering? She had heard the stories of other people who've been healed by God. She remembered what God had done. A lot of times in our lives, we're so focused on the present disappointment that we forget what God did just yesterday. And maybe it's not been yesterday, maybe it's been years. But in a moment when I've got to say, my doubt is really struggling. I don't know, I feel like it's out of control. God did not show up. He needed to fix this situation and he doesn't. I trust by God by saying, God, I remember your track record. What have you done for me in the past? And you say, man, I, I don't know if I have one of those. I can't remember a time. Here is the reason the church exists. Not to show up on Sunday. Not for a band to sing a song. The church, the people that Jesus called exist to speak faith when other people don't have faith, to share their stories when you can't remember a story for yourself. We cannot be silos. We cannot sit in a chair and just show up and go home because that's not what we're gonna take for us to live out our faith. We've gotta be real. We gotta be vulnerable. We gotta be open and say, here's my struggle. Here's where I str I'm angry at God. Here's where he's failed me. Do you have anything you can share? And we share our stories of our struggles. Let me show you a time that the God did show up for me. This is the way the church is meant to exist. This is the power 
of the thing we call church. It's not a building. It's not even a preacher like me spitting all over the place. The church <laughs> is people who understand that Jesus is, a, that when he rose from the dead, that he offers life. And we are meant to live our faith to let people know. And it's just not for the people outside. It's the person sitting beside you that's struggling today. I spoke to the, I, I, re, I spent a little, a little note to the high five team this week saying, hey, you're the, you're the face of Jesus for every person walking these doors. You need to be in your A game because you need to be silent because there's people walking through these doors right now. They're struggling in their marriages. They're dealing with death, who have lost jobs, who are fearing to lose their home. And I'm not using some, uh, I'm using real cases of people right now that I have met with, talked with, prayed for in this last three weeks, these stories right here. And their faith maybe needs to grow by hearing your story. It says, you know, the verse that all preachers quote about not skipping Sunday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forsake the assembly yourselves together, as some do. I'm sure when they wrote that verse, they were thinking about that one person that never comes on Sunday. <laughs> Paul's writing it. He says, don't forsake, don't forget, don't get together because some people are forgetting. <laughs> but what he really says is the purpose of it, not to check mark, not to feel good, not to be super Christian. Don't forsake the assembly of being together so you can encourage each other. When I'm isolated, the enemy's voice is so loud in my life. Heck, my own voice is pretty loud in my life. <laughs> I'm the meanest person I know to myself. And I got some, I know what to say to tear myself up. And the enemy jumps right on top of him and says, yep, mm-hmm. When I isolate, I know we don't want to be in a gathering. I don't like, we like big groups. If you notice, we don't have a big group, it's good. I don't like, I don't like being with crowds. I, I get that, I understand that. I just want to be, I need to be by myself. I just, I just, need, to, I just need to get it all together. I don't know of a time in my life that on my own, I ever got anything together. I mean, honestly. Now, maybe I isolated for a while and then someone said, I'm not going to get it. I'm going to go talk to him. And that conversation in a random place at a house out of the park, someone talked to me and reminded me of something that God had said. And that's where I started to find the recovery. We should have solitude. We should have some moments when we're with God. This week, I'm going to West Virginia during the middle of the week. Pray for me as I travel today. I'll be back next Sunday. I hope you'll be here. Don't, don't forsake the symbol of yourself together. <laughs> All right. But I'm going to the mountains. I'm going to the woods. My wife has to work. My kids are at camp. I'm going to be by myself. Not to isolate, to be in solitude. To hear what God needs to speak into my life because I'm too busy to listen and stop. But if I don't create times, if we don't create times to have solitude, we will run for isolation. And that place is a place of death. I don't know how I got there, but the fact that there is that Jesus says, I'm coming. And that I know that I'm going to be here. I'm going to take care of this. It's not in my timing. It's not in your timing. It's in mine. And Martha says, even now, I know you can't. I remembered what you've done. One thing Brian said in his, his little story, he was talking about, I said, how does it feel to see what God has done? You're looking back, he said, it made me feel cared for. And he said a really innocent, very powerful phrase, let me caught it. When I, feel, when I feel cared for, it was easier for me to surrender. We don't trust that God really cared for us. He didn't show up. He didn't fix that. That person died. <laughs> Amen. On that note, we'll move forward. But God's not absent. God was there. We keep moving reading scriptures forth. This is, we're going to jump up to verse 33 for sake of time. <clears throat> 
When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, which I, I love Scott, I was looking at this, why, why people believe that he did this. He was angry because this is not how it was meant to be, that death was not his plan, that brokenness and separation was not what he had intended from the beginning, and he sees the hurt and pain of separation, and it just ticks him off. Have you ever seen something? That's just not the way it's supposed to be. And God's angry. I like it that God gets ticked off. He's like, this is not how I created it. This is not how it's be. This is a result of sin and death. I hate it. It ticks me off. I'm angry. He says, where have you put him? And they told him, Lord, come and see. Great verse to memorize. You need a verse to memorize scripture. John eleven thirty five. 35. Then Jesus wept. I love that. It's easy to humanity. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's in his power. He knows what's going to happen. But he is so in tune with and so connected with the human experience that he sees the friends and family mourning the loss of their brother. And it moves him. Man, I don't know what your experience with Jesus is, but I need to see walk with him, see him weep mourn. He is broken with what breaks us. He is sad with what saddens us. That's the Jesus that we worship. I just don't feel it, Blake. I've not seen it. Walk with him. He weeps. And then he says... <clears throat> Then what they said, the, Jesus what? The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man, he'll blind him. Couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? Well, we do sometimes, right? I do this with Jesus. <laughs> you did all that. Why can't you do something for me? Look, look, at that. look what you did for them. What's wrong with me? You could do this. Why did you do this? Jesus says, hold on. Trust me. Then it keeps going forward. Jesus was still angry. This is verse 38. I don't know if you have it up on the screen. They were still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. He said, roll the stone aside, Jesus said. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been there for four days. His, the smell is terrible. Jesus said, just respond, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed? You know what Jesus does in a moment when we're like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. It's too done. It's too late. How do I have trust when it's too late, when it stinks, when I look at the situation? Oh, man. How many times do we look at situations we just, we just don't even think about it anymore? It hurts us too bad. Have you been there? They, they, they're so painful that I, just want, I don't even want to look over there. It stinks so bad that I don't want to deal with it. I'm just, I, gotta, I, I can't even think about it, God. You know what God says? He reminds her of his promises. When I am struggling with trusting God in my life, sometimes I've got to hang on. This is too, I can't even bear this, God. This hurts too much. I don't know how, I don't even see how it's going to happen. It's too late. Jesus says, remember what I told you. What promises does I speak into your life? Jesus says, the Bible says and gives promises to us. I think it says in Isaiah as well. Isaiah says, oh, you know, we'll go Proverbs, yeah, 31. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. Another word for trust is wait. Those who wait on the Lord, because trust is always a time issue. Let me say that again. Trust is always a time issue. I trust God until it takes too long. Those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar on high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That's a promise God spoke over you. Those who choose to trust and wait on the Lord, no matter the timing, no matter the struggle, no matter the disappointment, trust and wait on the Lord. They will find new strength. They will run and not grow They will rise up and and be able to on wings as eagles. Another verse, I, and this, this is what I do when I still with trust. I'm just telling you what I do. The next verse, I always, I say it a lot. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. 
seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. I grew up in the King James area. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord. Those are the promises. When we wait for God, he will show up. It may not be when you want him to show up, and it may not be the way you, he wanted to show up, but he shows up and the miraculous will happen. They wanted, they wanted Lazarus not to die. Jesus wanted to raise him from the dead. They wanted him now. Jesus said, I need you to wait because there's something greater about ready to happen. So Jesus rolls up on the scene. He finally stops crying. He says, roll the stone away. They say, it too smells, not too, not too stinky for me. Then he says, Lazarus, he calls him by name, come forth. And there is no doubt that no one saw this coming, that this man wrapped in cloth and with his pronounced dead, he starts to shake and he starts to stand up, begins to wiggle and walk. And the guy, Jesus says, well, don't just stand there. Take this stuff off. He's no longer dead. He's alive. I have come through in a way that you never saw possible. The very next verse, verse 45, says that when people saw what Jesus had done, many that were there believed on him. See, God's greater vision was not just to raise one person or to fulfill one person's wishes. He was here to bring all who were seeking to find hope and life in, our, in, our, in, in, in him. Jesus will bring life into your situation. It will not happen when you want. I can tell you that right now. And it will not be the way you imagined it. But God will speak into your life as you seek to trust him and wait on him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. God, as we see you encounter Mary and Martha and Lazarus, man, I know that I, I I am there so many times. I'm frustrated. I don't understand, God, that you don't do what I need you to do and the time I need you to do it. But God, help us to just trust you. Help us to know that your plans are far greater than ours, that your purposes and your perspective is bigger than ours. God, help us to trust you. Help us remember what you've done for us. God, help us be a church that's always walking beside those who are struggling. And God, may hang on to the promises you spoke over us. May we trust you when you disappoint us. May we keep our eyes on the dead places in our lives because you will bring life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen.